All right, so let's start. Uh, any questions from the previous class? Okay. Um, so previously we did a review of basic calculus as well as linear algebra. So let's get into what we want to do, that is solve convex optimization problems. Right. So first we look at unconstrained problems. We've already analyzed unconstrained optimization in one dimension. Uh, and we'll first try to look at what happens in higher dimensions. Again, things will be pretty much similar. Uh, but after all, even for unconstrained optimization, we want efficient algorithms. So for one dimensional convex optimization, we, we saw a few search methods which allow us to numerically compute the minimum of a one-dimensional convex function. Uh, can we do something similar and also give, hopefully give some guarantees for higher dimensional convex optimization problems? Okay. Uh, this is a well-studied area and we will only be very briefly going through some of the techniques, uh, not in much detail, but, but it will definitely give you a flavor of what can be done and what can't be done. Okay, so let's quickly recall what we saw in the previous class. We defined what a line is in n dimensions. Essentially, you take any two vectors. The straight line passing these through these two these two vectors is is defined as the set of all alpha u plus one minus alpha v, where alpha can take any value in R. So it's parameterized by this uh, alpha. And uh, you, you, you vary alpha from minus infinity to plus infinity, you will get the straight line passing through these two points. In general, any, uh, any function, so f of alpha, which takes the following form, say let's u plus alpha times v, denotes a straight line. This will correspond to some straight line. Right? In particular, it will be the straight line passing through u and in the direction of u. Uh, because as we saw, another way to look at it is u plus 1 minus alpha times v minus u. We also define a line segment as uh, it is again alpha u plus 1 minus alpha times v, but alpha is only varied from 0 to 1. At one end, when you take alpha equal to 0, you get v, and at the other end, when you take alpha equal to 1, you get u. So, for any alpha bit, strictly between 0 and 1, you get a point which lies strictly between u and t. So, using this, we defined a convex set as any set for which if two points belong to that particular set, then the, the straight line or the line segment joining these two points also lies within the set. And that um, essentially intuitively corresponds to our notion of convexity. Right. So, just as we define convex sets, we can also define convex functions. We will define a convex function on Rn, but in general, if, if we have some function f from say Rn to R, uh, in general f could be a function defined on some set where S is a subset of Rn uh, and in particular we will demand that S is a convex set. So we will want this function to be defined over a convex set then F is defined to be a convex function if it satisfies the property that f of alpha x plus 1 minus alpha y is less than or equal to alpha times f of x plus 1 minus alpha f of y. And this holds true for all 
alpha in that lies between 0 and 1 and all x y that belong to the set. Again, this is identical to what we saw in one dimension. Essentially, for a function to be convex, intuitively, what does a convex function looks like? It has this bowl shape uh, structure. So if you take any two points on this function, so think of it as a surface, right? So you take any two points on this surface and take the straight line that joins these two points. You What the definition says is that it is convex only if the entire function lies below this particular straight line. Right? The function value lies below this particular straight line. Um, so can you give me some examples of convex functions? Yep. Um, that's in one dimension. So can you give me an example of higher dimensional convex function? Yeah? The hemisphere. So how do you, how do you define the hemisphere? Okay. Okay. Um, something easier, which is very close to what you have. Let's take a function that is defined for all Rn, say, not R2 or R3. What if I take f of x equal to norm x square, the two norm of x, the whole square, which is <coughs> summation i equal to 1 to n xi square. Is this function convex? Okay, and how did you verify that this function is convex? Um, okay, correct. So, uh, triangle inequality, how did you use the triangle inequality? So, I agree if you took uh, the triangle inequality for just the two norm, that would hold. So, norm, two norm of x is convex because just by the triangle inequality. But I am taking two norm of x the whole square. So maybe let's look at a property of convex functions, okay, uh, which will help us at least analyze this particular example. So suppose that uh -huh. so, so we look at this later on, but in general, a convex function of convex function is not a convex function. So composition of convex functions is not necessarily convex. But we will do something similar to that. Essentially, we will try to take simpler convex functions and try to create a, a more complicated convex function uh, in the following way, uh, which is pretty straightforward. So suppose that f1 and f2 are convex functions. Now I claim that f1 plus f2 is also convex.
Do you see why this is the case? So let's just use the definition. So let's say f of x is equal to f1 of x plus f2 of x. So f of alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2. This would just be f1 of alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 plus f2 of alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 but both f1 and f2 are convex so f1 of this particular quantity is less than or equal to alpha f1 of x1 plus 1 minus alpha f1 of x2 and f2 of this is less than or equal to alpha f2 of x1 plus 1 minus alpha f2 of x2. Now again I can combine the terms that have alpha and the terms that have 1 minus alpha. This is just alpha times f1 of x1 plus f2 of x1 plus 1 minus alpha times f1 of x2 plus f2 of x2. Right? This is just alpha f of x plus 1 minus alpha of f of x1 plus 1 minus alpha f of x2. So using this property we see that summation i equal to 1 to n x i square this is convex. So what would f of x equal to um, summation i x i square look like? Uh, let's take two dimensions x y. So let's say z equal to x1 square plus x2 square or x square plus y square. Correct, for a given z, I agree, uh, but what would the three-dimensional shape, uh, would it be like a bowl or would it be something else? Okay. Um, let's try to just plot this. Let's say x equal to five five y equal to uh, f equal to x square plus y square. Let me just quickly look up.
Okay, so this is what it would look like. It would be like a parabolic shape. Correct. Now instead, if I considered the norm of x, so this is the norm of x the whole square. Right? What would norm of x look like? Same shape. It's going to look like a cone. So it will in fact look like a cone. Okay, so this is what norm of x would look like and on the other hand two norm of x the whole square that would look more like a parabolic surface because after all it is smooth. Right? It is differentiable at all points whereas norm of x it is not differentiable at x equal to 0. Okay, I mean it's good to keep these like, small examples in mind and also get a geometric view of what the function would look like. Okay, um, and we'll see why that is important in just a little bit. So, so now let's suppose that I want to minimize some convex function. So I'm given a convex function f from r to r n to r. Is assumed to be convex. We'll also assume that this is differentiable. So uh, we've seen previously that if I have this particular function, my, my goal is of course to find the minimum overall x in Rn of f of x. Right. And if the function is differentiable, then just as in the one dimensional case, so if I say that this is min, then let's say my goal is to find x star, which is that particular x which minimizes f of x. then x star should be the one that essentially solves the gradient of f at x star equals 0. So in case we are able to solve for this analytically, then, then we are done. But more often than not, we are not able to do so because it is possible that f of x is something really complicated. You may be able to get an expression for the gradient of f but not able to solve it. Maybe the gradient of f is some complicated polynomial in multiple variables and solving that is not an entirely trivial process. Right? So, so then how would we actually try to numerically obtain the minimum value? One such technique is, is what is called gradient descent. All right. And the intuition is basically the following. It's similar to the gradient descent that we saw in one dimension. Essentially, you keep trying to move in the direction of the minimum. Now, you may not know exactly where the minimum is, but there's at least hope that you can find in which direction the minimum might lie or in which direction the function value decreases even if you do not know the exact direction where the minimum might lie. Okay? And if you keep going towards in the direction where the function is lower than where you are, it is you are basically trying to go down a valley. right? You have some kind of a complicated surface and 
at any point again what i'm drawing is is a one dimensional curve but in in more slightly more complicated <coughs> could be some really complicated surface and you're trying to move towards the valley and you may not have a direct route to the valley itself but as long as you keep moving below where you are as long as you keep moving in a direction where you go to a lower level than where you are currently there is hope that you'll eventually reach the valley right? and that's basically the intuition behind all of these gradient descent techniques so formally the gradient descent does the following so the algorithm is as follows you start with an arbitrary x not doesn't matter where you start and you keep doing the following until you converge of uh, maybe for a fixed number of steps or eventually until you can't the function value doesn't decrease anymore you set xt equal to or xt plus 1 uh, let me define in terms of xt. xt equal to x t minus 1 minus <coughs> delta t gradient of f evaluated at xt minus 1. So you have this complicated looking surface, at any point you evaluate the gradient, the direction of the negative gradient is, is in fact the direction where um, the, so at any point you can construct the tangent, right? Um, the direction of the gradient will be the direction where or the direction of the negative gradient will be the direction where the slope of the tangent will be the minimum. That is something we can show. Okay, so let's let's take that as a fact for now. Which one? Ha, huh, correct. So I should say that where the negative slope is the largest. Or, yeah, so let's say the absolute slope is the largest. So again, I'm making I have not formally stated this claim yet we'll prove this later but this is again just for intuition so if you want to minimize the function you should keep traversing in the direction of the negative gradient there are a couple of things to keep in mind over here um, okay you keep moving in the direction of the negative gradient but how much do you traverse in the direction of the negative gradient you can consider a fixed step size where in which case what can happen is that you start with a particular point if you choose a large enough step size you could keep moving in this particular direction but then go too far ahead in which case you will have to again come back and so on All right. it's possible that you may even end up oscillating without actually ending up within the gradient but on the other hand, if you choose too small a step size, then potentially what can happen is that um, you, you, what can potentially happen is that you take too long to reach the minimum. 
So if we keep a fixed step size, then it's not entirely easy to to choose how do you choose that particular step size, right? So let's see a different approach. And in order to choose the step size, we'll see what happens. So now that we fixed a particular direction, right? We're only where we we're somewhere on this function on this surface, and we eventually want to reach the minimum. Right, the value of this particular surface. Now, from this surface, we've now identified a direction. We want to move in the direction of the negative gradient. What we want to decide is by how much. Okay. Um, so let's see if I look at the function along only that particular direction. What does the function look like? So I have a higher dimensional function, but I fixed a particular direction. So it's the view of the valley in one particular direction. What does it look like? What does this surface look like? So if you think of this particular two-dimensional function, so let's say that I'm I'm sitting somewhere over here. This visible. Suppose I'm sitting somewhere over here. And I decide that I'm going to move in this particular direction, the direction of this particular line. So if I restrict myself to this direction, this, this would be the function along that particular direction is a 1D function. Right? It's a one dimensional curve. It's a function of one variable. What, would, what properties do you expect this function to satisfy? You would expect that this is also convex, correct? So if I take a particular point and I look at the function along one direction, then the function would have to be, would also be expected to be convex. That's what intuition suggests. Right? And that's what I mean when I say that if I take a slice of this convex function, then along that slice, the function is still convex or to be a little more precise, so I'm given a function from Rn to R. Let me look at the function along a particular direction. Mm -hmm. So I pick an initial point. And I pick one particular direction. So alpha u plus x into, let's say, f of u plus x times v. I fix x and v. So sorry, I fix u and v. So maybe this is the starting point. Uh, in this picture, this would be my u. Maybe I start from this point. So this would be my u. And any vector along this particular direction, that would be my vector v. So I'm interested in knowing how this function behaves. g of x equal to f of u plus x times v. I fix the initial point, I fix the direction. So this green curve that I've drawn essentially corresponds to g of x. And again, intuition suggests that g of x should be a convex function of x. Let's just try to prove it. it should be straightforward we can just use the definition of convexity so let us look at g of alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 which is all f of u plus alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 
times v what do you think we could do next we know that f is convex our goal is to prove that g is also convex Any questions? So G is defined like this, right? So G of X is defined to be, so I fix two vectors U and V, any arbitrary vectors U and V, and I define a new function from R to R, which is G of X equal to F of U plus X times V. So if you look at u plus x times v, what does it correspond to? As I vary x, it corresponds to a straight line, right? A straight line which passes through u and essentially in the direction of v, right? Uh, so this would be a straight line and g of x is, is the function value along that particular straight. Okay, is that clear? x1 and x2 are not vectors. Yes, that's correct. So, here it's to be noted that g is a function from r to r, x is in r and I am choosing arbitrary x1, x2 which are real numbers and alpha which lies in between 0 and 1. Okay. Is, is this okay? So, in other words, you can think of it as though I am changing the coordinate system. Right? I am looking at the, this, this the original function is a higher dimensional function, it is a surface, right? But by picking, let us say, one particular straight line, which is essentially this straight line over here, I am looking at the function value along this straight line. So, you can think of it as this, as this straight line over here, right? So, it is this slice. So, g of x would be some curve. It is a function of one variable. And I want to show that this one dimensional function is convex. Correct. So, this is basically u is essentially 1 times u and alpha plus 1 minus alpha is equal to 1. So, I can write this as f of alpha plus 1 minus alpha u plus the remaining term. Now, I can rearrange the terms, all the terms that have alpha. So, it is alpha times u plus u plus x1 times v plus, so that takes care of this term as well as this term plus 1 minus alpha times u plus x2 times v. Okay. Keep in mind that whenever I am, whenever I have terms that involves vectors, so vectors are denoted with an underline. I want to distinguish this from just real valued variables.
So effectively, when I want to show that some function is convex, I always try to bring it to a form where I have convex combination of multiple terms. Right? So if I, so this, if this is my, let's say, y, and this is z, I know that f is convex. So I have f of alpha y plus 1 minus alpha z, which is less than or equal to alpha times f of y plus 1 minus alpha <coughs> times f of z. I just use the definition of convexity. I get alpha times f of u plus x1 times v plus 1 minus alpha times f of u plus x2 times which is simply alpha times g of x1 plus 1 minus alpha g of x2. So all of this is just to show that now that I've picked, I have this surface, I have this higher dimensional function. I pick a starting point and I pick the direction. If I go anywhere along that direction, the function is going to be convex. That's basically what I've shown mathematically. Now, again, coming back to the original problem, our goal is to minimize this, so basically reach the minimum point on this particular surface. And we want to travel down as much as possible and as fast as possible. So in one step, if I had to, if I started at this particular point, u, how far do you think I can go along this function, along this surface essentially? Intuitively, what do you think we should do? How should, essentially, how should, the, the problem boils down to, how should I choose my step size? Right, that's what we want to find. Correct. And if I look at this particular quantity, I want to choose x t given x t minus one. Correct. So if I think of x t as as a function of delta t, right? So I have f of x t minus one plus delta t gradient of f x t minus one. And I want to choose delta t, right? So let's look at this particular quantity. Let us look at f of x t, which is just f of x t minus 1, which is fixed. So this point is fixed plus minus delta t gradient f of x t minus 1. Correct? I want to know how to choose delta t. So let me look at this function, this, this quantity as a function of delta t. So if I think of this as a function of delta t, that essentially corresponds to this, this curve over here that I have drawn. Correct? So intuitively, how do you, how would you choose delta t? Again, keeping in mind that you want to reach the minimum as fast as possible. Uh, if the gradient is large, okay, let's, let's not worry too much about the value of the gradient itself. So, Suppose at this very point, let's take this picture over here. Okay, let's think about this pictorially. So, th so this is your x. This is your x t minus one. Correct. If you just had to pick an x t, where would you pick? Remember that you can only move along this particular direction. Ideally speaking, yeah the lowest point right you want to travel to the 
minimum, the, the global minimum of the function as soon as possible. So if you want to get to there as soon as possible, ideally you want to travel as low as possible. So, to choose xt, the intuitive thing to do would be to pick the lowest point along this particular curve. Right? Is, is, that, is that intuition clear? Okay. Because right now we have fixed the initial point, which is xt minus 1. We have picked a particular direction, which is along the gradient. And I want to choose my step size delta t. If I want to get to the minimum as soon as possible, then ideally I should choose delta t such that I, I reach the minimum of the function along that particular direction. This would hopefully result in an algorithm which reaches the minimum in the least number of steps. Okay, that intuition is clear. Okay, so, so then let us do that. And that this particular technique is called the method of steepest descent. <coughs> so just to summarize, what do we do? So we start with an initial point x0 and for t equal to 1, 2, 3 and so on up to until we reach the minimum point, you do the following. You take x, you have xt minus 1. You choose alpha t to be the minimum of f of x t minus 1 minus let us say alpha times gradient f of x t minus 1 overall alpha greater than or equal to 0. Okay. In fact, I do not need this restriction that alpha is greater than or equal to 0 because the minimum will always lie along that direction. So, this is my alpha t. I will simply set x t to be equal to x t minus 1 minus alpha t times gradient of f of x t minus 1. Okay. So, at every stage, I pick the direction along which the function, uh, along which the gradient is, uh, I, pick, I pick the direction along the gradient, along the negative gradient and in that direction, I minimize this one dimensional function. And wherever this function, this one dimensional function is minimized, I choose that as my next step, as the next xt. Yes. Okay. So it should be argument. So you choose your alpha t based on this in, in this particular room. In which case? So this this is a function this is in general f is of is an n dimensional function. The, again the point is that you don't have to check all the directions. The gradient will be the direction along which it's minimum. Right? This is just one iteration, one step, correct? So, if I if I take this particular function and view it, let's say I view this from above, okay? So, let's suppose I view this function from above. Maybe this is sort of something like a contour plot. So, suppose this is the view from above and this loosely says that function value is the highest over here, it keep, it decreases, decreases and so on. These are, you can think of them as, uh, this is a, what I call a level set in the sense that all the functions, the function value is the same at all of these points. Okay. So, 
what do we do? We start with some initial point, right? And you pick a particular, you, you evaluate the gradient at this particular point, okay? And the maybe the direction of the negative gradient is along this particular direction. So what do we do? You look at the function value along this direction and you try to minimize. Maybe this is the point where the function value is minimum. So this was my x0. Now this would be my x1. Okay. And now at this point, I, I again evaluate the gradient. Um, try to find out in which direction the gradient is. Uh, so essentially where I can minimize the function. And maybe the gradient is, the negative gradient is along this particular direction. Now I look at the function value along this particular direction. Minimize it. Maybe this is the point where it's minimum. I again, I keep repeating until I reach the minimum. Okay, so that's how, that's basically how this method of steepest descent works. Okay. Um, but as it turns out, this, uh, this particular algorithm has some nice properties. So, the first property is, now suppose I, I had an x0, I moved along the direction of the negative gradient, I came to some particular x1. Correct. Now I again evaluate the negative gradient and I move in some other direction. What can I say about this direction, basically the direction of, uh, along the pink line, relative to the direction of this orange line? Yeah? Okay, it does turn out to be 90 degrees, but why do you, why do you say so? Correct. Your intuition is correct. Right? Because loosely speaking, if it were not 90 degrees, then in some sense there should be some direction along which you can go even further below. Right? That's that's the high level intuition. But let us let's try to prove that or make it more formal. So suppose I have say x0, x1, x2 and so on are uh, the points obtained by the steepest descent algorithm okay so what is the direction what what, what is the vector along this particular direction It is x1 minus x0, right? The vector along this direction is x1 minus x0. What is the vector along this direction? It is x2 minus x1. So, what I want to say is that these two directions are orthogonal to each other, or in other words, for any t equal to 1, 2, etc x t minus x t minus 1. So, this is the direction from x t minus 1 to x t. And I look at x t plus 1 minus x t. So, this is the direction along which you would move to go from x t minus 1 to x t. And this is the direction along which you would go to go from x t to x t minus 1, so it, to x t plus 1, this is equal to 0. 
So these two vectors will always be perpendicular, the directions are always going to be perpendicular to each other. Okay, so let's see how we can prove this. Now let us look at going from xt to xt plus 1. Okay, what is, how do you choose xt plus 1? Uh, we chose alpha t plus 1 to be equal to the arg min. overall alpha of f of x t minus alpha times gradient of f of x. Correct? So this is my alpha t plus 1. What would happen to this particular quantity as I choose at alpha t plus 1? So this is a function of alpha. right? So this function is minimized at when I take alpha equal to alpha t plus 1. Right? Um, which means that if I look at this as a function of alpha, the derivative of this should be equal to 0 at alpha equal to alpha t plus 1. Okay. So if I look at d by d alpha of f of xt minus alpha times gradient f of x t evaluated at alpha t plus 1, this would have to be equal to 0. Okay, that's one point. So, <clears throat> so that's the first point, but also let us see what is x t plus 1 and in terms of x t and xt in terms of xt minus 1. Okay. So, what is xt in terms of xt minus 1? Yeah. So, if I take this particular quantity, so this is my observation number 1. So, let me take this particular quantity. So, basically I have this, right. What is this equal to? If I express xt in terms of xt minus 1, what do I get? Yeah, so it is <coughs> xt is equal to xt minus 1 minus alpha t gradient of f of xt. So this is actually just alpha t gradient f of xt minus 1. And similarly, this quantity is just alpha t plus 1 gradient f of xt. I mean that is natural because we are always moving in the direction of the negative gradient. right? So, this is just alpha t alpha 
t plus 1, gradient f of x t minus 1, transpose, gradient f of x t. Effectively, we want to show that these two gradients are orthogonal to each other. So now let's try to use this property that we have already. We know that this quantity is equal to 0. Right? Let's try to use the chain rule to expand the left hand side. So I can view this f as a composition of two functions. So first I take alpha and I get this particular function. Okay. So I view f equal to some f1 composed with f2 of alpha. So let me write it as I was calling this g of alpha. So, g of alpha equal to g1 of g2 of alpha, where my g2 of alpha is equal to xt minus alpha times gradient f of xt. And my g1 of x is equal to simply f of x. So, g2 is a function from r to rn. It takes a real number and outputs a vector. And my g1, again, it takes an n-dimensional vector and outputs a real number. Right. If I just use the chain rule, what do I get? So, what is the derivative of g of alpha? This is my g of alpha. I want to compute the derivative of g with respect to alpha. Yeah? The derivative of g1, which is what? So, this would be equal to the derivative of g evaluated alpha. What would be the dimensions of this? So, g, so uh, let me write this as sorry, g1 of alpha. Let's look. Here. Yeah, let's say g2 of alpha, let us take that first. So, g2 is a function from r to rn, right. Uh, so, what would be the dimensions of g2 of alpha? It would be an n dimensional vector, it would be a rope vector or a column vector. Um, it is a function from r to r n. So, it will be a column vector, the derivative. So, the gradient of a function from r n to r is a column vector. 
the derivative is in fact a rho vector right so this is a function from r to rn so the derivative will be a column vector the jacobian would be a rho vector right so this is a column vector times the derivative of g1 with respect to x so this is a column vector so this would be d g2 of x where my d g1 evaluated at x so it's a column vector times a row, a row vector times a column vector but what is d g2 of alpha basically the derivative of this with respect to alpha right it's just the negative of the gradient of f of xt this is equal to minus gradient f of xt it's just the derivative of g2 of alpha with respect to alpha so this is just derivative of alpha is equal to 1 it's a linear function in alpha so it's just minus gradient f of xt and what is the derivative of g1 of x equal to Correct. So, it is the gradient of f uh, transpose evaluated at x. Correct. But what is x equal to? So, we know that this quantity is equal to 0, right? The derivative of g with respect to alpha equal to 0. When I take alpha equal to alpha t plus 1. alpha t plus 1, alpha t plus 1, alpha t plus 1, but what is x equal to? x equal to x t minus alpha gradient f of x t. So, when I take alpha equal to alpha t plus 1, what do I get? x t plus 1. So, this is in fact equal to gradient f of x t plus 1 transpose gradient f of x t which is equal to 0 which means that the two gradients so subsequent gradients are orthogonal to each other so if you use the method of steepest descent then you will move in a sequence of directions which are always going to be orthogonal to each other. Of course, so in the teeth step, it is going to be orthogonal to the t minus 1 step, but you cannot say that the t minus 1 step will be orthogonal to the t plus 1 step. Okay. So, effectively, if you look at the picture over here, so you start with some direction, let us say this is the direction of steepest gradient. In the next step, this is going to be definitely going to be orthogonal to this. It will be along this particular direction. And at the next step, this is going to be orthogonal to this. So, it will be along this direction and so on. If you minimize, then you move along this. Okay. This we are assuming the function is convex so it lot there's only one minimum it will give you the global minimum right. in fact it brings it brings us to another important property okay you can try to argue this property on your own 
essentially if so let's suppose that f is convex and the gradient of f of x is not equal to 0 for all x not equal to the point of minimum okay so the gradient is never equal to 0 except at the point of the minimum which means that there is only one unique minimum right it's not flat anywhere then if x0 x1 <coughs> and so on are points in the method of steepest descent f of xt is strictly less than f of xt minus 1. Okay, so if the gradient is never 0, then what will in fact happen is that f of xt, so at every in every step you are always making a positive change. So in other words, you are always going to a point which is strictly below the point where you will. Okay, you will never end up with a point where the function value is still the same. Okay. Because even if you think about, again, if you go back to this picture, suppose I started with this particular point. If I chose my step size not well enough, then potentially I could have started here and got to this particular point, wherein the function value is still the same. But using the method of steepest descent, that will never happen. Of course, naturally, because you are trying to minimize the function along that direction. But more so, what is more is that you will always move below where you were originally. So what this means is that if f is uh, also bounded, then the method of steepest descent will converge in a finite number of steps. No matter what happens, you will eventually reach the minimum. This is guaranteed to eventually reach the minimum. You may have to wait for an extremely long time. That is a different story. But you will eventually reach the minimum. That is guaranteed. But this is not a guarantee that you can give for other types if you choose the step size in any other way. Because potentially you could keep overshooting and never reach the minimum at all. So, and, and this is true irrespective of where you start. Okay, any questions? So, well, we have now seen a method. So, okay. So, let us try to recap what we have seen now. So, we are, if we are given an arbitrary and a function of n variables and you want to minimize this function, assuming that it is convex, then we now have an efficient algorithm. Right? We have an n-dimensional optimization problem, but we have brought it down to an iterative algorithm where in each step, you are only solving a one-dimensional optimization problem. Correct? So, I had my original n-dimensional optimization problem. At each step, I am only solving a one-dimensional optimization problem, for which we have already seen algorithms before. Right? You can use 
uh, the bisection rule or any of the other approaches depending on whether you know the if you if you know the second order uh, derivative also if, if that can be computed then it's even better if you can use newton's method right but even otherwise there is a way to efficiently minimize a, do, or perform unconstrained minimization of a convex optimization problem so that is straightforward so the our goal for the rest of this course will be to see how do we solve constrained optimization problems constrained optimization problems efficiently okay so another point to note is that we didn't make any further assumptions on f f has to be convex and f should, we should be able to evaluate the gradient that's it the gradient should exist at all points as long as these two properties are satisfied we have an efficient way of minimizing this function and even if the function f is not convex as long as the gradient exists at all points we can at least reach a local minimum that is guaranteed by this particular algorithm okay now we can we will of course try to develop a similar theory for constrained optimization problems wherein i have i want to minimize f of x subject to some constraints x lies in some constraint set and we'll see that the kind of constraints we can handle are convex constraints we are always interested in problems wherein the objective function is convex and the set of constraints is also convex but as we'll see getting some more information about the problem can potentially help us in finding a solution more easily or at at times just knowing the geometry and structure of these types of convex sets and types of convex functions can help us actually devise better solutions or sometimes even devise solutions where we think a solution may not be a solution may not exist or is very ex or is extremely difficult to find okay so to see that i'll just inter quickly introduce one problem okay so it's a it's a real world problem where and it's called the graph matching problem or the bipartite graph matching okay now many of you after you join let's say you, you join the masters program or an undergrad program you were looking for let's say advisors right and uh, at least i guess some of you have gone through this where you give a list of your preferences of advisors and you are allocated advisors based on certain preferences now let's say there's a symmetric version of this problem wherein you have n parties okay let's say there are n students and n let's say faculty okay so each student can give a preference as to which faculty he or she wants to work with similarly let's say that a faculty can also give a preference of which student he or she wants to work with. so for every faculty student pair there's a certain preference which is let's say some real number okay um now again a student may give a subset of the faculty as his or her preferences and the, likewise the faculty as well okay but for now let's say that all all students give a certain preference value for each faculty and likewise the goal is to come up with a matching uh, essentially which which means that every student should be matched to one particular faculty and every faculty should be matched to exactly one student okay so let's say that we have a version uh, wherein 
only the students prefer let's, let's, let's simplify this further let's assume that only the students preferences are true so each student gives a particular preference and that's it so so for for this for student 1 you have preference p11 p12 p13 and so on so pij is the preference of 1 or preference of the ith student for the jth faculty let us say and again we need we want to formulate this as an optimization problem which means that we also need an objective function so these are so this is uh, the preferences let us suppose that we want to maximize the total preference that's one rule it's okay. one way of matching the goal is of course to ensure that each student is with one faculty at the same time you also want to make sure that no faculty gets one more than one student so it's a match in that particular sense and you want to maximize the sum of so i and j are matched how many matchings exist uh, n power n so how many matchings exist which ensure that so total number of matchings i agree is n power n but how many matchings exist such that these two constraints are satisfied? There exist n factorial many matchings, right? So this, this is what is called a perfect matching. There are n factorial possible perfect matchings. Now, of course, you could solve this problem by looking at look at each perfect matching, find the sum, evaluate this objective function, and take the one that maximizes this objective function. But that has obviously has complexity n factorial, right? So can we solve this? So that's one algorithm. It's a brute force approach to solving this particular problem. Can we come up with a polynomial time algorithm that solves this perfect matching problem? Okay. So that will be the goal. Um, and I guess we're almost out of time. So let's stop here. This is a good place to pause. You can just think about it. How would you formulate this as an optimization problem? Okay. The objectives are clear, but all that remains, the first step is of course to come up with a clean mathematical statement of this optimization problem. Is it just by accelerating?